if you like. You may also lift up a voice or a perspective that needs to be brought into the room, right? Because we don't pretend that this is everything that needs to be said about criminal justice issues and the South. Would anyone like to begin? Okay, we've got a hand over here. Okay, and I think we are on? Okay, great, thank you, sir. Hand was raised. Uh, yeah, uh, please stand or raise your hand so uh, one of our volunteers can come to you. I'll just yell. I have three loud voices. No, I'm just going to use the microphone. Hi, I feel like we've had um, people giving examples from three obviously incredible organizations. And I was just wondering, as people who exist in this field, if you could maybe uh, mention some other either organizations or organizers who are really um, who you really admire in this field as well, and this who else is doing this work. Just attention, streetwise and safe. Uh, 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 at at Southern Poverty Law Center. Song. Prism, um, let's see, Detention Watch Network, Center for Children's Rights, Juvenile Justice um, Coalition, Coalition for Juvenile Justice. I'm sorry, I, I, California Women Prisoners Project. Say it, I can't just say CJNY. Do you? What, I mean, besides the one you say, mi gente, um, mi gente. yeah, the not one more importation campaign as well. Familiar. So here we're a law project in New York, Transgender Law Center, National Center for Transgender Equality, doing a huge amount of work. Um, we can't hear your mic. Right here. National Center for Transgender Equality. Yeah, it's not on. All right. <laughs> National Center for Transgender Equality, Transgender Law Center, doing a huge amount of work. Great, thank you. I don't think this is working either. If you can take mine. Hello, everybody. My name is Melissa Thomas. I work for the Freedom Center for Social Justice in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, one thing um, anyone can ask, which is particular to you, Shana, am I saying your name correctly? Um, I work with the Do No Harm campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the South. And one question that I was wanting to know, are you finding that clergy are connected to these young individuals within the prison system? Um, when you said that, um, we're fortunate to have one of our clergy allies um, from the Do No Harm campaign that works with um, the prison system. But I know what you say in particular, you're finding youth, LGBT youth of color. And I know it's culturally, it's always important to be connected to your clergy. So I was just wondering if clergy is involved, if not, is that an avenue that has been considered? <coughs> No. <laughs> I can stand up. Um, thank you for that question. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, clergy is absolutely involved. Not in the way we need them to be involved. <laughs> and I can, I can give specifics. So, um, and this is not just in juvenile detention centers, this is uh, in youth serving uh, facilities in general. So one thing that I've seen across the board, uh, Louisiana specific, is um, conversion therapy. And I've actually attended a religious service in a detention center. I'm not even gonna name that detention center. Um, and one of the things that they harped upon was the femininity of black men. 
And you can almost imagine what was said in that conversation in the name of the Lord. Um, so that's some of the things that we absolutely do see in the prisons. Um, one thing that we have made uh, possible is that youth are no longer forced to go to religious services. Now one way facilities have gotten around that is religious services are used as a kind of a positive behavior type instrument. So you're allowed to go to church to get away from your dorm or get away from your cell and things of that nature. So of course, to get out of their cell, youth are going to go to church. Now what's being taught at these services is not necessarily helpful to them. It's a lot of times very, very harmful. And I'm not going to say that's every uh, minister that goes into the facility, but it's the overwhelming majority. So Chris, we got a question over here. Where are we? Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Carol McAllister from Durham, North Carolina. I just want to hold up our HIV positive brothers and sisters who are being prosecuted throughout this country for behaviors that pose little or no risk of HIV transmission. They're also being placed on sex offender registries and serving lengthy prison sentences. Um, and it's definitely part of this work, and I'm sure they're in this coalition. The Zero Project uh, is, is one group that's doing fantastic work around this issue. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Por las calles 
por mi casa diciendo Virga. Yes, please just raise your hand and you can keep them raised uh, so somebody can come to you. don't have the willingness 
They don't demonstrate the leadership. They don't get feel enough pressure from any constituency that is yelling at them enough to get them to do something about critical needs like mental you know, health issues and mental health needs in our society. Huge numbers of people are incarcerated. The criminal legal system becomes used for people who don't belong there in any stretch of the imagination. They're just warehousing them. So I think that that's another set of challenges, is the political challenge. How do you get these political leaders to, in this era of we don't want taxes, we don't want government to be spending anything, you know, to actually recommit to spending on certain things that are not the construction of prisons, the incarceration of people, the policing of people. We have to really make a movement that is really pushing against criminalization of everything. So when the International Megan's Law was passed, you know, honestly, it wasn't on the radar screen of many people. There was no outcry to say, Congress shouldn't pass this, President Obama, you shouldn't sign this. It was just a cheap giveaway vote that they didn't feel any pressure, and what it did is expand criminalization in a new way. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but you're right on. immigrant rights that uh, within our community it's really important to have conversations about criminalization uh, because we're constantly being pushed to divide you know between the good immigrants and the bad immigrants right by, by local policies by national policies so I think uh, part of this work begins in having conversations in our communities and ensuring that we're not throwing anyone under the bus I'll speak to what you were saying about um, Abolition. So, in order to do the work of abolition or reform, you must first understand that this system is a hassle, right? So you could chop the head off at one end and it's gonna come back in another way. And you could chop that off and then it's gonna come back in another way. So I think, um, just thinking strategically, um, knowing that first it is a hydrant, but then also having things in place to kind of stop that hydrant from, e from even regenerating, right? So. Like Irvish said, blocking uh, commissions to build prisons, um, blocking, uh, making private prisons illegal. We've done that for juveniles in Louisiana. Uh, we got the, on, it's, it's worthy of snap, but then I'm gonna tell you the downside of it. So, <laughs> we got the juvenile prison, um, <coughs> this private prison closed in Toluca, uh, about, 10 years ago, um, and what ended up happening was, it is no longer a juvenile prison, but now it's a detention center. So detention centers, are unfortunately, are not, well, private detention centers are not illegal in Louisiana, um, so it's an immigration uh, detention center. So we get one win, and then something else pops back up. So we just have to always be ready and understand that it's a game of chess and not checkers. And we have to be five steps ahead of uh, the system in order to abolish it, because we want it to implode. We have to get in there and make it implode. We almost have to be the Trojan horse of 2016. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Lucy de Henderson, North Carolina. And my name is Lucy, and I'm from Henderson, North Carolina. Uh, poniendo un punto de vista de la cual estamos todos aquí. From a uh, point of view, which is one of the reasons why we're all here. Es para pelear por los derechos de la igualdad. And that is to fight for the right to equality. Como todo hombre, como toda mujer tiene derechos, la mujer transgénero también tiene derechos. As every man and as every woman has rights. Transgender women also have rights. Entrando un poco también en la en el área de la inmigración. And going also into the immigration area a little bit. Como Latina tengo tengo preguntas. As a Latina, I have questions. Soy una mujer transgénero. I'm a transgender woman. Busco respeto e igualdad que cualquier otro. 
I seek for respect and equality just like anybody else. Mi comunidad es muy más atacada que cualquier otra comunidad. My community is a lot is attacked a lot more often than any other community. Y como persona puedo decir, and as a person I can say, tengo un ataque doble. I'm being attacked twice as many times. Como latina inmigrante, as an immigrant Latina, y como trans mujer transgénero, and as a transgender woman. A todas las organizaciones presentes, to all the organizations present here, en muchas, en muchas organizaciones que he asistido se ha sacado el, la misma pregunta y también va para todas las organizaciones presentes. In many of the organizations that I have been to, one of the questions that has been risen that has also applied to all the organizations present here today. Habemos mucha gente con potencial para seguir peleando de hechos como este. There are many people with the potential to continue fighting for rights like this. De cierta manera, hay mucha fuerza para sacar y mucho, mucha persona que está dispuesta a unirse. In a way, there's a lot of strength to be drawn and many people who are willing to unite with us. Tanto como para defender la mujer transgénero como para la, la comunidad inmigrante en general. In order to defend the transgender women, as well as the Latino community uh, as a whole. Pero si hacemos un llamado a todas las organizaciones que están ya establecidas, but we do make a call to all of those organizations that have been established, que tomen en cuenta que las organizaciones que están creciendo, to please take into account that the organizations that are growing, que nos ayuden, to help us out. Porque nada se puede empezar sin nada. Because we can't start anything if we have nothing. La iniciativa ya la tenemos. We have the initiative. Personalmente le puedo decir, I can personally say, que hay mucha gente detrás de mí que está dispuesta a trabajar conmigo. That there are many people behind me who are willing to work with me. Que yo sí me gustaría escuchar y de aquí llevarme que con qué cuento con las personas para tener más gente y unir más gente a este tipo de, de peleas. And I would like to know what I can count on and what I can take from here in order to add more people to our struggle. Que como ustedes todos saben, that as you all know, todos empezaron de abajo. Everybody started from the bottom. Espero en cualquier momento alguna de esas organizaciones se me acerque, que tengo muchos proyectos en mente. I hope that at any given moment, many of your organizations will come to me because I have many projects in mind. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for putting that out there. Um, so at Breakout, we're currently working with the Congress of Day Laborers. Um, and so we're working on a toolkit to help other organizers and organizations um, through the cultural barrier and language barrier of organizing across intersections. Um, it's not done yet, it is a work in progress, but we, um, we paid attention to that very fact that there are many organizations out there that really want to uh, organize across sectors and really do need to build their base and um, need resources to help them do that. So that's one way we're trying to help out with that. Great. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I see that there are several more hands out there, and I'm so terribly sorry. I've been given the hand signal that it's time to wrap up. Um, however, you don't actually need my permission to talk to each other. So please, I know, right? surprise, surprise. Please continue these conversations with each other throughout the weekend. Um, my last question for the panel as we wrap up. If folks here have been moved by this conversation, what can they do after today? What can they do? Can um, I have something very, very specific. As I mentioned before, uh, building is said to be important this Sunday. So um, I just posted a call to action on the event for LGBTQ South Conference, um, asking you to please make a call. I don't know what time it is, maybe 4 p.m. It's we have one hour. We need to make a call to Congressman, Burr, uh, Congressman Butterfield um, and ask him uh, to interfere 
and, and ask for uh, Wilden's importation to be stopped. So that's something very easy you can do. You can leave a message. Also, if your organization can make a statement, um, sending it to uh, Congressman uh, Butterfield and asking him to inter intervene. <coughs> yeah, and, and, and work to stop uh, Wilden's importation. Um, this work has been done by Alerta Migratoria NSA, which is a grassroots group in North Carolina. Um, so that's a group that you can follow to know more about uh, what you can do with regards to the rates happening in this state. Um, and you can also follow us, the Southeast Immigrant Rights Network, uh, on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we usually post uh, call to actions as well. Would you, would you say, and um, where can they find that information? Yeah, it's on the event Facebook, for the Facebook event, for the LGBTQ South Conference. Um, and you can also find, find it on the Southeast Immigrant Rights Network. You want to see the number? Uh, and the number is 202-225-3101. 202-225-3101. And what we're asking is for uh, Congressman uh, Butterfield to call, to urge uh, DHS Secretary uh, Johnson to release Wilding immediately. So while you're walking to your afternoon workshop, let's blow up his phone. A <laughs> um, couple of things that you can do to help is number one, keep doing the work that you're already doing. I think everybody in here is doing dynamic work. Um, I think just the fact that you're here is dynamic enough. You're either trying to learn or you're trying to further the work that you're doing, so keep doing that. Another thing that uh, folks can do is um, I know that there's a lot of people in here who could do a LGBT 101 training, right? <laughs> Public defenders' offices, believe it or not, need these trainings. So as much as you can get into the public defender's office or even the prosecutor's office in the juvenile sector, or even in the courts, I'm being ambitious right now. Um, but as much as you can to infiltrate these systems and begin the conversation and begin educating folks on the needs of queer and transgender youth across the board, then I think that will be great. Um, and it's just starting a conversation. We started the conversation in Louisiana and we've made strides and we've made progress just based on having conversations. So I think that's something that folks can start to do in their local community. Amazing, thank you. Um, I think. One of the groups, uh, to the question earlier about what groups, um, I one of the groups I respect the most in this work is Black and Pink which is a, a network of um, LGBTQ people who are incarcerated, formerly incarcerated. And you can get involved in being a part of Black and Pink's work by uh, it's organizing a chapter, um, getting involved in doing support and advocacy work for people, with people who are incarcerated. Uh, Black and Pink did this incredible report uh, based on a survey of 1,100 self-identified queer people in, in uh, federal and state prison. It just came out um, in October, and it's called Coming Out of Concrete Closets. And it really gives you um, a picture of what's going on and who's there. And it's just a, a kind of a one picture of a really too big, too, too big a problem. So black and pink can organize. I think another thing to do is to do um, local monitoring and advocacy in jails, police departments. There's groups that are doing that, but if there's no group, form your own. Create some mechanisms to demand accountability. If there is a detention center, if there is if ICE activity in your area, get involved with the Southeast Network and other advocacy groups. Get involved with SONG, get involved with grassroots leadership, which is, it, it does a lot of great research on um, private, facilities and private, privatized uh, services. And finally, I would say to the political question, I think that we have to be much more politically active yes. as you know, queer radicals, as whatever you identify as. And, um, and what that means to me is making sure that your sheriff, your city councilors, your county commissioners, your mayor, 
every local official you can get in front of knows that you care about criminalization and that you want to dismantle the system and that you believe that they should do everything in their power. So that means school disciplinary policies that are you know, being used to police black and brown youth overwhelmingly and queer youth disproportionately. It's, it's, every, it's everywhere you look. And there's work to be done. And what's cool about it is that it's really work you can do locally. Please join me in thanking this incredible Started. Thanks for coming uh, to the conference. Thanks for coming to this workshop. Um, really excited to have an opportunity to, to talk with everyone. We hope this is going to be a discussion. We're going to give you some information that we have, and we'd like to get some information that we know that you have so we can sort of figure out what to do about the, the what I'm calling the, the backlash, right? These anti LGBT legislation. I know staffing the backlash, I thought that was clever. Uh, if anyone's here for a job interview, I just want to disabuse you of that. We are not hiring. <laughs> but, but the point is that, that this is a tidal wave of, um, of efforts intended to stop equality, roll back equality, and everyone needs to be engaged in this. We won marriage equality in the Supreme Court, and uh, that's not the end of the game, obviously. And there's a lot uh, that we're doing to push equality forward. but. We have to look out for these, uh, these legislative efforts because they can really uh, be problematic as we as we continue to evolve uh, as a society. So that's what we're, we're going to talk about today. Um, uh, my name is Beth Luttrell. I am a senior attorney at Lambda Legal. Lambda Legal is a national organization pushing for LGBT equality in the courts and in the courts of public uh, uh, opinion. We also work on behalf of HIV. Uh, positive people. I am in the Southern Regional Office uh, in Atlanta. Uh, I've been a civil rights attorney for 15 years since I graduated law school. That's all I have done is, is uh, civil rights, mostly on behalf of the LGBT community. Uh, first at the ACLU uh, and now at what I call the Gay CLU, which is <laughs> Lambda Legal, focusing uh, even more specifically on, on civil rights. Um, I could tell you about each of these amazing panelists. All of them are friends of mine and inspirations of mine uh, who have uh, wonderful stories and lots of accolades and are brilliant and spiritual and everything else that, that makes me continue to do this work. But I think it would make more sense if I just turned it over and let them introduce themselves, talk a little bit about the expertise on this topic that you, that you think you can bring. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Crystal Richardson. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I am the Director of Advocacy for Equality North Carolina. Um, I've been with them for about two years. I started as the Moral Freedom Summer um, organizer, working with uh, groups like Freedom Center for Social Justice in the, in the place of peace. Um, and from that coalition work, we uh, got funded to continue that work um, and just really work to get non-discrimination protections in, uh, in Charlotte particularly, but across North Carolina, and um, just really try to work with the unusual suspects, get some LGBT folks in, in racial justice spaces and get some uh, folks working on uh, racial justice issues in LGBTQ spaces. So uh, lots of lessons learned there, and I hope that um, I can share those with you and, and uh, help you to be able to get some non-discrimination protections in your area. Great. 
Crystal, we, we met here, didn't we? We did. At the first annual, which was two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and, and she wanted to sort of do the kind of work that, that I was doing and, and get into the movement, and there you are doing amazing work. And so, to a certain extent, maybe there will be some jobs that come out. <laughs> I mean, this is a really important conference where you make a lot of great connections, um, and the people that you are meeting here uh, go on to do wonderful and, and important work. Simone. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Simone Bell, and I'm currently the regional director for the Southern Region of Lambda Legal. Um, I started that job in November. Prior to that, I served six years in the Georgia legislature. I am the first out black lesbian to be elected to a state house in the United States. I actually worked for Lambda Legal prior to running for office. I was the community educator for the Southern Region. So I went to college and got a PhD in the legislature on how to work bills. And then I came back to Lambda as the boss. <laughs> That's not bad at all. Um, so I've always been an activist. I started in the streets. I'm an issues person. And so um, come to me with an issue. I'm going to research it. And I'm the one who would always sign up to burn something down, march make signs, all of that kind of stuff, which is why people reached out to me and asked me to run for office, because you really do have to be well-rounded, or it's actually, it's, it's recommended that you um, come with a platform of being well-rounded and well-educated on a lot of different issues. Um, something that I hope we can really get into a conversation with today is how I did the work outside as an activist, but then how I went inside as a politician. And I see myself as that I went inside as a spy, and now I've come back out to let our communities know how things really, really work on the inside. Without being offensive, most people know, think they know how politics works, but they really have no idea. And so as we talk about the backlash and where legislation is coming from, my hope is that we'll have a conversation and you'll ask me questions and I'll be able to explain to you how things went down in the Georgia legislature. And although each state is very different, politics is politics is politics. And so today we're going to get the inside game information and hopefully you all be able to take it back to your communities. And what I really want to do is build a bench. And that's what we need. We need a political bench in the LGBT community. So I'm happy to be here. Y'all are wearing glasses, so I don't feel as smart as you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, for having me here, and I'm really glad to be back on this side of the table. Thank you. Uh, Maggie Garrett. Hello. Um, my name is Maggie Garrett. I'm the Legislative Director at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Uh, we are in D.C., though I do have a lot of experience working in the South. I used to work with Beth at the ACLU of Georgia, where I both litigated and lobbied there for five years. And then before that, I, I was at the ACLU of Alabama uh, as the staff attorney there. So I have little knowledge of how things are maybe a little different um, down here than in Washington, D.C. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about Americans United and, and why this is such an interesting issue to us um, is, you know, it's about religious freedom and about religious refusal. So Americans United was started 70 some years ago. And so we do some of the typical things you'd expect from an organization called Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which is pure st church state stuff like prayer in schools or prayer in the legislature and school vouchers and teaching evolution and all of those things. But also really key to this is the concepts of just religious freedom in general. And so Americans United is um, a group of both, we have a bunch of people who are secular, a bunch of people who are religious, and we represent both of those communities. And we believe that religious freedom is really important and that religious freedom means freedom to believe and practice your religion, but it doesn't mean the right to harm other people or to take away other people's rights. And so that is a very important concept to us, and we've been working on it for a long time. And just recently, we started this new project called Protect Thy Neighbor. And I'm sure all of you are really interested and want to grab one of these for me afterwards. Um, but it just gives you sort of our website and things. But um, we've started this new project to really focus and highlight the religious refusal issue. And of course, as you know, a lot of what you're seeing today is rooted in religion, right? Like all of the anti-LGBT stuff, where does it come from? It comes from this claim that it's anti-religious. Um, the the anti-women stuff, the anti-LGBT stuff, the anti-repro stuff is all rooted in this idea that it's violating someone else's freedom to give you your rights. 
Um, and so we really pushed back on that. And um, so on our website, you can find legislative trackers for state bills. You can find maps. You can find legal analysis. You can find blogs. You can find news, all these sorts of things. Um, and so that's sort of where we fill the space. Absolutely. I mean, it's been, it's been quite a tool, the Protect Thy Neighbor website and the work that Americans United is doing. And Maggie, in particular, is my go-to for uh, church-state questions, so I can sound real smart and educated at the <coughs> time and just get her on a, a text message. Yes, they can do that. <laughs> um, so let's get into it um, and talk about, hold please, <laughs> I, uh, is there a question? I guess I could just use the button for that. Okay, I think we're moving. Talk about the legislation, there we go, I think we're on it. Um, and just to give you a sense, so the, the overview, I know that there are a lot, there, I think there are a couple of, of other workshops that are going to talk about RIFRA and legislation. Um, this workshop is intended to sort of give a broad view uh, of the breadth and sweep effect and potential um, legal challenges that can be, can be raised. And so looking at it nationally, there have been, don't quote me if there's media in the room, Patrick, I saw you. About 141 bills uh, at last count that were introduced this session. That's a lot. That's about twice as many as were introduced last year, which were introduced as a result of the pending Supreme Court case. So any question that this is not uh, an intentional, uh, deliberate backlash and effort to, to stop equality, I think is, is belied by the number. 33 states have bills that have been introduced, 32 are RIFRA type bills, we'll talk about what that means generally. 14 are uh, FEDA type bills, First Amendment Defense Act bills. Uh, 24 uh, uh, pretend or purport to allow government officials or the government itself to discriminate based on uh, beliefs, religious or otherwise. There are eight additional bills that deal with limiting uh, the role of government in marriage. So some legislatures are talking about getting out of the marriage business somehow. Um, eight specifically target adoption and foster care placement, allowing folks and agencies themselves to discriminate uh, in placement, uh, which RIFRA and FEDA also do, but these are directed specifically uh, and encouraged, which all of these uh, proposals whether they become law or not, and especially if they become law, really are harmful in the sense that to the extent someone isn't thinking or thinks they can't discriminate, these bills let you know, sure you can, and encourage uh, discrimination. There are 20 bills that we counted that specifically target the transgender community, and if you separated those bills out, if they, some of them are rolled into one, but if you separated them out, there's about 174 efforts, attempts, to get legislation passed that would uh, harm the LGBT community. So to make sure that we're all speaking sort of on the same page, what do we mean by RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, um, they are in essence a, an exemption or an excuse, religious excuse to discriminate, uh, provided defense to all kinds of laws uh, and books and regulations, administrative agencies, uh, and, and et cetera. And the, the two key phrases are if the government action uh, substantially burdens uh, someone's uh, sincerely held religious belief, then the state has to prove that they have a compelling governmental interest and that this law is the most narrowly tailored way to meet that interest. So it's a lot of legal speak, but it's important because I want to talk about lawsuits that we could bring if these do pass and I need your help, we need your help in, in understanding what this law would mean because we need plaintiffs and we need the right facts. And, and so a lot of these legal issues in particular, the, these words are gonna be uh, the way that we will either be able to strike these down or, or, or uh, uh, win uh, cases. Um, understand that these uh, offer more protection than the First Amendment. The First Amendment says if there's a generally applicable law, applies to everyone, it's not targeting religion, it doesn't say Christians must do this, so it's just everyone has to um, do uh, something, um, and then you can't, uh, then there's no religious exemption. 
in the First Amendment, which allows people, obviously, the freedom of religion, uh, doesn't apply if it's a generally applicable law. Because to permit this, the court said, the Supreme Court, would mean that everyone is sort of the law themselves. They, they become the law themselves. They get to decide. Who was this crazy liberal who came up with this idea? Uh, no, no, there's the late Justice Scalia. Uh, but the, the point being that these laws, RIFRAs themselves, are, are, are actually uh, much more uh, burdensome than the, the First Amendment itself. And just to give you a visual, uh, th here's where the RIFRA legislation that, uh, that, uh, that was introduced before I left Atlanta uh, two <laughs> days ago, uh, 16 states, 25 that were introduced, 25 active, um, one passed both houses in Georgia the day that, that, that I left Atlanta. <laughs> we'll talk about, uh, uh, that's now on the governor's desk, but none have passed this year. When we talk about the First Amendment Defense Act, because the First Amendment apparently is, is under attack, no. The Constitution protects the Constitution. Nonetheless, uh, state laws think they can do a better job. And what fate is due is they're sort of a marriage-specific uh, RIFRA. They say if you have a religious belief about marriage, then you're exempt from whatever law, regulation, professional codes of conduct, etc. Like doctors shall do no harm. You know, lawyers should treat everyone uh, respectfully. Whatever the, they go much broader. They are about government action. Uh, in the broadest possible sense. Um, and here we have 14 in nine states, 13 remain active. Wedding services is another very specific type of legislation aimed at the LGBT community. And they are, uh, they allow specifically, so it kind of gets kind of more narrower and narrower. So one's religion, any kind of religious belief, RIFRA, FEDA, marriage, if you have a religious belief about marriage. And generally it also says, that sexual relations shall be um, uh, confined to that kind of a marriage, different sex marriage, which also means that single mothers, uh, uh, people who have uh, you know, sexual relations outside of uh, a marriage are also eligible to be discriminated against. But wedding services gets even narrower and talks about uh, <coughs> if you provide goods or services, lease space, et cetera, uh, for wed weddings, uh, you can you can use this religious exemption. You can sort of opt out from otherwise general laws. Uh, 25 in 16 states, 23 active, one passed. So Florida had uh, two bills rolled into one about wedding services, and the other was about the Pastor Protection Acts, which you may have heard about. We call them the, the PPAs, Pastor Protection Acts. They're generally <coughs> written uh, to protect uh, pastor and clergy and, and ministers from having to marry people outside of their faith. I call this the Department of Redundancy Department. Let me repeat, the Department of Redundancy Department because the First Amendment protects pastors, ministers from having to marry somebody who violates their, their, their rights. Well, the problem here is that these are getting broader and broader to include uh, any commercial entity uh, that is affiliated in any way with a religious organization. So that could, um, for example, private schools in, uh, in Atlanta, uh, Emory University is affiliated, many, many colleges are. I pick Emory even though they're, they're uh, wildly uh, progressive and, and protective of LGBT people, but they are, I don't know, 20 mile block. I mean, they, they're one of the biggest employers in the city of Atlanta, but you know, if the law like this passes, which it's on the governor's desk, it could allow them to discriminate, to turn away same-sex couples from being able to, to get uh, married, fire, and hire people based on religious uh, exceptions. Uh, 25, 16, 21 active, uh, one, that Florida bill rolled into, into the same bill as marriage services. So here's just another sort of visual. It's 52 that have been introduced in 21 states. Another type of, of bill we need to look out for, I mentioned the adoption <coughs> of foster care that of course protects these placement agencies that are in charge of placing children in need of permanent and, and good quality homes and it allows them to, uh, if they have a religious belief, to be exempted from that, to discriminate. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I think the uh, RIFRAs and the FEDAs also have the same effect, but these are specifically targeting adoption 
and foster care. Here's where they have been uh, introduced, six different states. Um, and again, a lot of this information, I want to thank Maggie, I don't know if you're in charge of the website, really helpful stuff, protect thy neighbor. Um, religious exemption laws, the government, right? You guys are familiar with the SB2. Uh, those of you who are um, who live here in North Carolina, uh, there's a host of different kinds of bills. The language may be a little bit different. You know, in essence, they say that government officials don't have to uh, facilitate uh, weddings that violate their, and marriage licenses, et cetera, that violate their uh, religious beliefs. Perhaps uh, Kim Fields, uh, Davis, my bad, uh, comes to mind when you think about uh, a religious <laughs> exemption. Um, 16 and 9 states, 15 are still active. There's also access to health care that's specifically targeting uh, health care services. So if someone has a religious objection to providing health care services, and there was one situation, I can't remember what state, but where a same-sex couple came in with their, uh, their infant and were turned away and said that they would not provide uh, services or, or see that child. Uh, eight of these have been introduced in eight.